when we're working with hypothesis tests with proportions, sometimes the English reveals for us the hypotheses in a way that's kind of unique to proportions that isn't so prevalent in the tests of means and standard deviation and variance that we'll see later. So um, a couple things. Prevalence, we learned in section 5.4, it's the assumed proportion of a population that has a specific trait or condition. So they'll say, you know, um, I don't know, diabetes has a prevalence rate of 33% in the U.S. So that means that the assumed proportion of people that are diabetic in the U.S. is 33%. So that word prevalence is giving you a proportion. And then we also know that majority means more than half of the population. In other words, P is um, greater than a half. So if you see the words more, or, or excuse me, most, most or majority of people, that means that more than half. So you're talking about an alternative hypothesis, that your alternative hypothesis H1 would be that P is greater than 0.5, which means, of course, that your null hypothesis must be that it's equal to 0.5. Minority, minority, uh, means less than half. So a, min a minority of senators are from a, the Democratic Party, for example. That would mean that it's less than half. So it's giving you your alternative hypothesis of P is less than 0.5. In proportion problems in particular, sometimes the alternative hypothesis is cued in by these words rather than by writing out actual numbers. So we're going to practice that with some non-alternative hypotheses right here. So we have a healthcare researcher claims that most people at a football game wash their hands after using the bathroom. Ah, well, there's that word right there, most. Now let's pay attention to that. Okay, um, she collects data by surveying 1,023 random people at the game, finds that 62% had washed their hands after using the bathroom. Okay, and of course, any healthcare professional will tell you that it should be 100%. All right, but that most business is giving you your alternative hypotheses. So I know that H1 must be equal to P is greater than 0.5. That by default means that my null hypothesis, because the null hypothesis is always equality, so it always has to be the equal sign, it has to be H0, it has to be the same parameter, which in this case is proportion, because most implies more than 50% of the people, and it must be equal to 0 0.5, 50%. All right, for Sub-Saharan Africa, the prevalence rate, right there, that word. That word is cueing in that you're talking about proportions. So the prevalence rate is a proportion, um, and it's assumed to be 38% right here. So the prevalence rate of HIV is assumed to be 38%. So what they're telling you is that your null hypothesis is equal to uh, P equals 0.38. Right. Then your alternative hypotheses must be either less than, greater than, or not equal to. So you see this word here, lower. The lower part means that it must be less than 0.38 for the alternative hypothesis. So this becomes a less than symbol right there. So the prevalence rate portion lets you know that it's a proportion problem and the 0.38 lets you know that it's 0.38 and then the lower than gives you your alternative hypothesis right there. All right, now we're going to begin this next question, example three, but we're not going to finish it because it's very, it's three pages, so it's going to take us a while. So we're going to start it in this video and we'll finish it in the next one. So we have a hypothesis test here. A market researcher for AT&T believes that more than 20% of third graders have cell phones. She conducts a study by surveying a random group of third graders and her results are in the StatCrunch output below. StatCrunch being a computer program that I use to sometimes do the heavy lifting for you and then ask you a whole bunch of questions about hypothesis testing using that output. So you can see that I've labeled some stuff here and we'll come back to these things um, later on in the problem. Suffice it to say that the count is x, the total is n, your sample size. Those are the same x and n that you learned about in 6.2 with a binomial probability distribution, where x is the number of successes and n is the number of fixed trials, i.e. the number of people you ask. 
um, p hat is your sample proportion, the standard error of your p hat. We have a formula for it's back a page or so. We learned that we have to use this formula right here for the standard error of the proportion. So I'm going to highlight that for later use. Right there. Back on um, in this semester's course, back on page 262, but those pages might adjust for what the semester you're watching this in. All right, and then this test statistic we label Z0. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. Okay, so what type of um, test did the researcher perform and what are the alternative and null hypotheses and symbols and words? So you can see right up here, um, because I boxed it, that your null and alternative hypotheses are written out for you already in symbols. So you can tell this is a right-tailed test because it has a greater than symbol in the alternative hypotheses. Now the null and alternative would be that p equals 0.2 and p is greater than 0.2. Those are the symbols. But the words are explaining it in context. So we would assume that 20% of third graders have cell phones unless we can prove that it is more than that, which is our claim. So the claim is that more than 20% of third graders have cell phones. Now in order to conduct a test, we have to check whether or not we met the criteria for conducting a hypothesis test for proportion, which are these three requirements. They're the same or very similar to the ones for making a hypothesis test for, or excuse me, for a confidence interval for proportions. Very, very similar. So we need the sample to be random. Well, that's easy. It was given to us. We need uh, our in sample to be independent. In the case of proportions, we need um, n to be less than or equal to 0.05, capital N, where capital N is the, sa the population size and little n is the sample size. And then we need to check normality. We need to check that n times p0 times 1 minus p0 is greater than 10. Okay, so the first thing. We know it's a simple random sample because it's given to us in the problem setup. It says a uh, simple random sample. Actually, I think it says random sample. But we assume that that's a simple random sample. Everything's fine. Given to us. Now, the second one's a little strange, and it often is. We often just kind of assume that we have independence, even um, though we don't know the population size. We never counted how many third graders are in the US, there are in the US, but we can kind of assume that 542 is far less than 5% of all those third graders. Heck, it's probably less than 5% of all the third graders in this my state of Michigan, let alone the whole of the US. So we're waving our hands out a little bit um, because we don't actually know capital N, the population size, but we know that that population size must be quite large. So 542 is a safe bet as being less than 5% of all of that. Now, if you're given the population size, you can actually do this calculation. But if you're not, then you're stuck kind of pretending like you're a magician and just saying ta-da. Now, the, other, the third one, in order to prove normality, we have to check. We need n times p0 times 1 minus p0 to be greater than 10. Well, n, if you recall, up at the top was 542. P0 is your zero hypothesis value of 0.2. So we take 542 and we multiply it by 0.2 and then times it by 1 minus 0.2 and we get 86.72, which is well below, above the threshold of 10, so we are happy, right? So this is a yes. So we have three yeses, therefore we have met all three requirements. We have shown that we meet every single one. Which is a good thing because otherwise technically you're not supposed to go on any further. All right, now we're going to calculate p hat. Well, p hat is the same p hat you learned about in chap um, chapter 6, section 2. Section 6.2, the binomial distribution. X is the number of successes, N is the sample size. So you take 122, you divide it by 542, and you get 0.2251. So that would be your p hat. Now the standard error of the sample proportion, if you recall, we have a formula for back a few pages ago. It's the um, standard error of the p hat. So we don't really know what p is, but we're going to use the assumed p value 
of 0.2 from our hypotheses. So even though we don't know the value of p, we're going to use p0. So it's the square root of p0 times 1 minus p0 all over n. So let me go grab the calculator. I'm going to hit second square root. And then I want p0, which is 0.2 times 1 minus p0, which is 1 minus 0.2. If you don't need the time symbol in there, the multiplication or the parentheses will take care of the multiplication. I'm going to divide it by 542. And sure enough, I get 0 0.01718. You could also use the um, fraction underneath the square root if you so desire. But hit the second fra square root, and then hitting alpha F1. You want number 1, which is numerator over denominator. And then it looks like this. If I can get my 2 in there. There you go. All right, so there we have that. There's our standard error. Now the test statistic, let me remind you where that comes from in the process. The test statistic is Z0, which is your step 3. So technically it's P hat minus P0 over the square root of blah, 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 blah. So we don't need all of that because it's given to us in the problem. They tell us that Z0 is 1.4604. So it's all calculated for us. So we're going to use that fact. So I've boxed that and the p-value. Um, I boxed the test statistic in red and the p-value in green so you could see them. So that test statistic 1.46 there it is in red so that's the part they're looking for right here and then the p-value is that 0 0.0721 so now I want to draw the picture for that so let's go back and look at the test um, we're on the p-value side of the house because we're looking at a p-value approach so we want to ignore this whole classical approach business and look just at the p-value side since we're doing a right-tailed test, this is the picture we need to look at. So we need to draw that curve. Well, it's already drawn for us. We need to shade it such that 7% of the graph is shaded and have a Z0 statistic down beneath it. That's what we're going to use for that p-value. right? And we're going to label everything just like it's labeled here. So it might not seem like it, but the actual important part of this is shading and labeling appropriately. That's the real work. Do you know how much 7% should look like? And the answer is it should look about like that. That's exactly computer drawn as 7%, in case you're wondering. And if you're wondering, oh, how would I know it's 7%? Well, you also know that it's 1.46 standard errors away. So you know that the inflection point from chapter 3 is where the first standard error would fall. So go about another half of a standard error away and draw your vertical line. Right? Since the curve is already drawn for you, then it becomes important to know how much to shade and label, right? Everything appropriately. So this is Z0, which is your test statistic, and there's your p-value labeled. All right, so then what decision would we make? So if we go back to the steps, it says, and I love the p-value method because it's very simple, you reject H0 if your p-value is less than alpha. If what you found was rare, had a low chance of happening, you will reject the null hypothesis. Well, what we found had a p-value of 0 0.07. 0 0.07 is, in fact, less than our 0 0.10, which is our alpha. Therefore, we will reject the null hypothesis. So that means we make the decision to reject the null hypothesis because our p-value of 0 0.0721 is in fact less than our alpha, which is 0 0.10. That means that we will write our conclusion as there is sufficient evidence to support the claim, and then we write down what the claim is. More than 20% of third graders will have cell phones. Just a little reminder, we went over in section 10.1 how to write conclusions. They have to be very specific. It has to be there is sufficient evidence or there is not sufficient evidence. And you must write out that claim of the alternative hypothesis in words. All right, we'll stop right there and we'll pick up here for the next video.